Bristol Rovers don't play in Bristol. They're a football club without a home. For two years, Rovers have played at Twerton Park in Bath, the home of non-league Bath City Football Club. Facilities aren't perfect, but for Bristol Rovers, a club facing the harsh realities of modern football, it's all they can afford. For nearly a century, Bristol Rovers played at Eastville Stadium in Bristol. Today, the pitch remains, but most of the stands and the goalposts are gone. They were forced out because they couldn't afford the rent. They didn't own Eastville. In 1940, under financial pressure, they sold it to the Greyhound Company and became tenants at their own ground. Today, the M32 motorway borders the site. It's made the land too valuable for football. Soon there'll be no trace of the game at Eastville. And as the shops take over, Bristol Rovers play their home games in a different city. Their form has improved dramatically since February. Early this season, they were prime candidates for relegation, but a recent run of particularly good results has placed them in the top half of the third division. Bristol Rovers then at Eastville, their home ground, to kick off against Aston Villa. Aston Villa high in the first division, semi-finalist last year, and a big crowd here at the Eastville Stadium. They began life as the Black Arabs in 1883. A year later, in hooped shirts, they had become the Eastville Rovers. By the turn of the century, Bristol Rovers had become well-established in stripes and by the First World War, they were settled in the Southern League. Their most successful period was in the 1950s. Bert Tan's team twice achieved Rovers' highest position, sixth in Division Two. In the 1960s, Rovers returned to the Third Division. The club has never been a prosperous one, often forced to sell good players to bring in vital income but stability was maintained by the substantial crowds. In the 1970s, as crowds dwindled, the pressure on new managers increased. Terry Cooper arrived to a rapturous reception after a glittering career with Leeds and England. But 18 months later, he was out to make way for another former First Division player. Don't give a check, you go all the way to the line. Bobby Gould was still in charge when Rovers moved to Bath. He was replaced by a former England captain. Francis. He launched. It's there! He loves that! And Kennedy was left looking at space. She's full. Comes to Francis. Must be now. It is! Scored by the England skipper. Francis came to Rovers as a player in 1985. He returned as a manager to a club with no home, no money, and precious little experience. They're a bit bloody sharp, though. You're half an hour late. Okay, that's everything stems from there. They get out there, it's all dead. Okay, Christian, when it's on the other side, if he's going in there on the run for the ball, you cut the kicker off, okay? Yep, so. He has a strong commitment to the club. He's even invested £10,000 of his own money. Nine months ago, the new manager had two straightforward aims. The two goals really at the start, having spoken to the directors at the start of the season, were to hopefully make sure we were in, going to stay in the third division because most people had us as odds-on favourites to go down and also to <clears throat> try and clear a deficit on the year of 150,000. Well done, Percy. Well held well that, Christian. Well done, sir. Because when I was a player, I enjoyed my time here. Um, the supporters got together to pay my wages to play here, which is something, you know, in this day and age, you don't 
to get easily. I think there's a great spirit here. Um, sometimes you can have an affection with a place. I did at Rangers, I did at Crystal Palace, um, and I think I, ha I have here, and I think that's important, that you work in an environment that you're happy with and the people that you're happy with, and that they're happy with you. And I, I feel that there's, there's so much um, good faith here in trying to keep Bristol Rovers alive, and I think that um, that's one of the main reasons, I would say, why I came here, really. What a good effort Channing's making. Gary Mabbard is one of the best players the club has ever produced. But like so many others, financial pressure forced an early move, this time to Spurs. He's the son of a Rovers player. He emerged through the youth side after a childhood apprenticeship on the Eastville Terraces. I always remember going to watch it when my father was playing there and uh, the crowds were a lot bigger and there's a great atmosphere down there. And they always used to have, I remember, always behind the goals, used to have all big rose bushes, and uh, it used to be a, a very, very nice atmosphere. And it was the same when I joined as an apprentice. The, the club, as I said before, were a great, friendly club, and it was a great club to join. There's a turnover of players, and recently being managers as well, and the turnover has been in incredible. And uh, I think that's the way that the game does generate its money, and the way that smaller clubs do survive, by obviously producing uh, good young players coming through the youth sides. And then what finally happens is a shame for the club itself, but those players get noticed by bigger clubs, and a lot of, a lot of times, because of financial reasons, those clubs can't hang on to those players. So it's, it's a shame, really, but I think that, that's the way of football. The man who sold Mabbott was Bobby Gould. Gould has also moved to the First Division and has since returned to buy talent he nurtured at Eastville. In two weeks' time, he'll lead his new team into a Wembley Cup final. But they've not always been in the big time. I came here to Wimbledon. Where were Wimbledon ten years ago? They were in the Southern League. Um, Bristol Rovers have got the experiences gained. And I'm sure the present board, who have worked so hard, don't want to sell the players. Somewhere along the line, yes, they sold John Scales to me for £70,000. They sold Robbie Turner to me, but that surely has stabilised. They must and must adhere to the budgets, because if you don't adhere to your budget, then you will get into problems. I adhered to the budgets that I was given at Bristol Rovers, and I worked very hard to cooperate with the board. And perhaps people at Bristol Rovers a lot condemn me for leaving. Well, I had the opportunity to come to the First Division, and I think that opportunity I took with both hands because I wanted that for my career. But I think if people look back, they will look back on the stability that I tried to keep at the football club. And not only that, the board who worked with me and understood what I was trying to do have appreciated the hard work that I did put in. And along that, I think it's helped Bristol Rovers to stabilise. The club went wrong when it sold its ground just after the war. There's no good looking for scapegoats because that was the time that this club started to dwindle. And ever since then, it's had to fight that major problem and lose in Eastville. And I think if the truth was known, it was looked upon more as a greyhound stadium because they were the owners than a football club. Football club wanted it to belong to them, it didn't, but the Greyhound people had sole control. In 1980, disaster. The South Stand was burnt down, the club's offices and dressing rooms destroyed. Well, it's a bit of a shambles at the moment, but we, we, we've got all the... Uh, kit sorted out that we say that they saved yesterday in the boots and uh, we're just moving it all up to Ambrook and uh, we'll sort it out up there. And that was the beginning of the end for Eastville. The Hambrook training ground became their real home. It was the club's one remaining asset. There were considerable problems running the club from Hambrook, but as far as the fans were concerned, Rovers were still at Eastville. The big crowds were reserved only for the big games. Dwindling income couldn't keep pace with the rising rent. Players were sold to clear debts. In a drastic boardroom upheaval, all the established directors resigned. 
Such was the deficit, the new board had to sell the club's one remaining asset, the training ground at Hambrook. The Dunford family, more used to running a prosperous dairy than a struggling football club, headed the team of local businessmen, which suddenly and unexpectedly found itself in control. It was more or less sort of thrust upon us. You know, we were very pleased to be associated with the club in the first place and to do what we could to help, uh, but we had no intentions whatsoever of actually uh, forming our own board at that stage and taking on the, the fight for survival. Did you feel rather let down, the fact that the <coughs> previous chairman left so rapidly? Um, everyone seemed to be leaving very rapidly. Uh, it was a very worrying situation. Uh, we brought my father in as chairman, uh, Mike Ross and Ron Craig joined us as directors. Uh, and at that stage, we were sort of having three, four board meetings a week. And those board meetings were last, lasting, on average, for about five hours. And it was a very worrying time. And I think we all lost sleep uh, over the football club. And, uh, we've never, ever lost sleep over our own businesses. Uh, but it was a tremendous task and uh, it, was, it was a great sort of time for concern for us. Basically because we only had one year left at Eastville and because of the costs involved and we had to cut dramatically as quickly as we possibly could, uh, we decided to leave uh, before that 12 months was up. I feel this historical move to Bath gives this club a marvellous springboard to reawaken interest in the footballing public in two major cities. In the end, we were uh, forced into a situation of having to go to Twerton Park because there was nowhere else to play. The first year there was a, a memorable year, a very hard working year, but it saved the football club. I reckon it's more exciting over here because there's a small ground and get a good atmosphere and all that. But I reckon it feels better because like, the ground is a little bit better, like, but uh, it's a good atmosphere here. Huh? Well, I liked it anyway. Initially, I was very upset. I didn't like the feeling of coming over to Twerton, but since I've been here, I've, I've quite enjoyed it. I think we've lost a lot of support by coming over to Bath. Um, we can't, when we get the big games, we can't get the people in, and the money that we saved on the rent, and we're losing out on gate receipts. Well, I've only started watching Rovers since they came over to Bath, and I think a lot of people are in the same situation as myself. Um, it's not that far to travel to see a league club play. Um, the, the football is very entertaining. I think it's exceptionally important they move back to Bristol. Uh, they've got a, a large town which uh, can obviously accommodate two football teams. It has before, and there's no reason why it can't now. And uh, I think people still, you know, I've said people enjoy coming here to Twerton, but I think they deserve a ground in Bristol. It's very important they get back there. I think, quite frankly, it would open the floodgates for the people who tell people they're Rover supporters but actually are not motivated sufficiently by distances, transport problems. And I think that will be seen in, in itself and evidenced by the numbers that attend their first home match in Bristol. Would you like to see a move back to Bristol? Yeah, definitely. That's the number one thing. I mean, we can't train there in a week. The only time we go there is on a Saturday to play. So that's the only time we go there. We don't train on the pitch. Um, you never go there unless it's a game. Um, and everything has to be sort of lifted, put into cars, and we all move to Bath, and we play at Bath, and afterwards we load it all up, and we all move back to the training ground or wherever it is. So that is obviously um, something that I should think every other club in the Football League doesn't have to do anyway. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that do a tremendous amount of work, particularly for this club, more so than any other club I've been to. I mean, Ray Kendall, he's responsible for all the kit side of things. And really, sort of, he's like a father figure, I suppose, in that. He takes a bit of stick now and then with the lads, but um, he's been around a long time, and um, he's a great help to Bristol Rovers. And, and that's the sort of spirit that's within the club. From my own personal point of view, I was pleased to leave Eastville because I couldn't see a future for the club there. Um, Twerton Park is a place where we've been able to reconstruct the company, we've been able to reconstruct the playing staff, and getting into a, a situation where we can return to Bristol 
should the opportunity arise. And uh, it's been a staging post, but I mean, it is a, it's a homely place. Okay, we cannot get the, uh, the 10, 15,000 people in there, but the atmosphere there, even with three, 4,000, is, is tremendous. All right, Raymond. Yes, Bob, and you? We've got probably as good a home record as anyone in the first in, in the third division, and um, our home form has been excellent. Players will play where they've got to play. Um, and my main concern, me personally, and at the moment, is Bristol Rovers present, and that is um, playing at Bath and trying within the budget and within the system we've got to try and get some sort of success. Ray Kendall's attempts to make Twerton Park a home even extend to the boardroom. I don't think it's had any effect on Bath City. In the programmes, we both advertise each other's matches. And I think if you're a fan of a football club, then you will still go along and see them. I would think in our present sort of form, we can survive there for about five years, because unless we get our own stadium, unless we get our own other sources of income from that stadium, uh, we're going to find it very, very difficult to keep making ends meet. We haven't sort of got money to go shopping with, that's the main problem, um, with our commercial activities and the lottery and the income from the uh, gates. Uh, we can just about balance the books as, as things are. Um, but to actually improve the squad to any great extent, then the more people we get through to see us, the, the more we can improve the team. And uh, the money will be spent in that direction. It all depends on success on the pitch. Keep showing the bruises. It's always a number 15. I can never get in one to 11. Can I? Very superstitious at times. I was given 15 to start with and we won the game, so I kept it. Simple as that, you know. If they'd give me 33, I'd have won 33. So it doesn't really matter. Um, most footballers are a little bit superstitious. This is the thing. The only sport left at Eastville is greyhound racing. Only the evening meetings attract more than a handful of spectators. The stadium owners are paid to hold the meetings, so there's always something for Britain's 10 million punters to bet on. The big betting chains make sure the odds at the track side reflect the money being placed across the country. When all horse racing is cancelled, more than 11 million pounds can ride on the Bristol card. Well, it's, I don't really think it's a, it's a, sm a sports stadium as such, is it? You know, none of the Rovers have gone. It's an entirely different place, isn't it? It is just for dogs. Oh, really, we could do with a purpose-built stadium just for dogs. Because I think the football's had it anyway. Are you a Rovers fan? In the years gone by, when we used to get a lot of people out here then. I think you just got to look round and see that it's gradually been eaten away. I think that is fair comment. I mean, the car parks against the rail, uh, there's not much more to eat away, is there? We're a nation of shoppers now, aren't we? We've got to find something else to do on a Saturday afternoon and go shopping. I don't know what my father would have made of it, pushing a trolley around a supermarket. You'd have thought you were a load of pumps. Shopping and redevelopment is putting pressure on many football clubs. It's taking over the sites because most of the football clubs, they've got sort of inner city sites, they're, they're very valuable. The clubs themselves have used the sites to, to finance the playing side over the, the, the last 20, 30 years, so they're probably in hock to the, uh, their bankers or whatever. So they ha at the end, they have to sell the grounds. So I think lots of clubs in the Football League in a few years' time are going to find themselves in difficult circumstances. The clubs haven't been run professionally. 
or, or the, the finances haven't been there, or they haven't had the direction to, to uh, the people in the clubs haven't had the right direction. And they have to be run as a business, and they're in the entertainment industry. And if you want people's money, you have to provide the entertainment, you have to provide the facilities. You know, we want to make football, if we can get a new stadium, the in thing. It will be a nice place to go and be seen at. And, uh, you know, it, people are looking for a little bit more value for their money nowadays, rather than just go and stand out in the rain uh, watching 22 players be negative in a game of football. You're listening to Radio Bristol Sport, and the Rovers match against South End at Twerton Park just getting underway. Jerry Francis hoping his team can avoid their sixth defeat in a row. I've been at the highest level, I've been captain of England. I know pressure at all levels. You know, you get involved with it. The only, the only difference is that you're het up the same as the players. The only thing is that um, they have got the opportunity of getting it out of their system out there, and you're still sitting there and you can't do anything about it. I've never been a very good loser, um, and I don't think if you want to be successful, there are good losers. I think you can lose uh, in a certain way, but you don't have to like it. And I don't like it, that's for sure. Just about coming up to half time in the Rovers game at Twerton Park, and still no score. Half time is the most important time um, in the whole game because you can get them sat down and you can do things and you can change things. And that is very, very important. So that 10, 15 minutes is vital to changing things. You can get your three points, I think. Well, I was taken along by my father in 1964. And it was just the atmosphere hit me. I think it, in those days we were sort of challenging for promotion and there was about 17,000 people at Eastville. And it was so charming. I just never sort of experienced anything like it. And from that moment on, that was it. I, I was hooked. And that's what we're trying to recreate again for other people. The move back to Bristol won't be easy. The choices are limited. In 1984, plans for a £10 million stadium at Stoke Gifford were abandoned and the land was sold for housing. One suggestion is that Rovers should share the first division facilities at Ashton Gate, the home of rivals Bristol City. It's a great ground there, it's a great stadium there. I mean, it seems silly to me to have a, such a good stadium down there and Bristol Rovers having to move out, out, of the, out of the city to go and play at Bath. We actually played a few games there. When the stand burned down at Eastville, we moved across to Ashton Gate and we played there for a few of our league games that season. And I was very surprised that moving out to Bath, I mean, sort of nine, ten miles outside of Bristol for your home games, I would have thought the, the perfect choice would have been to have shared with Bristol City Ashton Gate. It's a little bit like sort of Liverpool and uh, Everton on a smaller scale, but the feeling is still there, uh, the rivalry is still there, and there is a big divide in the city, and there is blue and there is red. But even if supporters would accept ground sharing, the rent for Rovers would be too high. A new stadium is the only answer. Land at St Anne's in Bristol is an obvious choice. Administered by the new Urban Development Corporation, planning controls would be less stringent. The training ground at Hambrook would have been ideal for a new stadium. Access would be direct from the motorway, but it's greenbelt land and not available for football. We've been very careful to, uh, you know, try and complete things and, and get things signed, sealed and, and delivered, uh, rather than you know, create lots and lots of hope. I mean, the, you know, it's been very difficult for us to live with the press and media speculation uh, at this time about the ground. And it doesn't make our job or our life any easier because everyone is saying, well, where is it going to be? And you get the phone calls and the letters. We have three or four options. And uh, as soon as one of those options you know, reaches fruition stage, we can actually then 
and sort of bring it out into the open and say, here we are, this is what we have, this is what we need to uh, aim for with regards to finance and planning and go forward. But, uh, you know, at the moment, everything is speculation. We're looking for a multi-sports complex so that we can in include lots of different sports uh, and, and also make it available to the general public, also conference facilities. Uh, there has, has to be a market for these things, and I think uh, really, if you look at athletics in particular, there's a, a shortage of top quality facilities in, in the West Country. So we could be talking of a modest stadium of one million pounds, or we could be talking of a multi-sports complex of 12, 14 million pounds. Still nil-nil at Twerton Park. The final whistle will be going any moment now, and we'll be going straight over there for a full report on the game. Rovers have attracted an average gate this season of three and a half thousand. It's enough to survive, but not to flourish. The loyal fans will always follow, but how many will fall by the wayside in the coming seasons? A new stadium is still a long way off. The site has to be finalised, finance arranged and planning permission obtained. The recent run of success may have lifted the side and boosted support, but Rovers' financial problems are far from over. Even if it was signed at the moment um, for the stadium, you're looking at four to five years before that stadium is built and completed. Now, that four or five years, you've still got to work at Bath, you've still got to carry on, and you've still got to try and get success. I am here now at this present time, and my main concern is what's happening this year and next year at, at Bath and with the present Bristol Rovers team. And that's the main thing, that Bristol Rovers are still operating. Because if you haven't got a Bristol Rovers, you haven't got nothing. I think the, the feeling is the same, the depth of the feeling is the same, whether you support Liverpool or whether you support Hartlepool. Um, you love the club, you want to see the team win, whether they're playing in the first division, the fourth division, the Western League, they're still your club. And Bristol Rovers has, has been around for over 100 years, and there's lots of tradition there. Um, grandfathers, fathers, sons, they've all supported the Rovers. It, it, it's family tradition in, in some places, and uh, it would be such a pity if, if that died and it, and it wasn't available to them. If the club is going to go into the 90s and into the year 2000, it's got to be set up right, because I feel that there are lots of clubs in the country at the moment who will disappear. Uh, through lack of support of finance. If we don't get it right and if we don't get back to Bristol, I don't think there will be a Bristol Rovers.